We all search for that spark which fuels our desire to fully engage in our lives. We look for the courage to experience moments where we can come alive instead of watching life pass us by. You're listening to The Front Row Factor, leaving fear and insecurity behind by exploring stories of top performers that are living life in the front row. Get ready to stand up, step up, and live it up with your host, John Vroman. What's up, Front Row family? Welcome to another episode of the Front Row Factor podcast, where we talk to people who are living big and giving big. Today, we're chatting it up with Brendan Maxwell, co-founder of Utopian Coffee. This is a guy who got his business started at age 16, selling candy in school. He even started tracking margins and building a team. After a number of entrepreneurial adventures, including painting house numbers on curbs and a car detailing an estate management company, he co-founded Utopian Coffee back in 2000 which has been delivering amazing coffee directly to your mailbox. It is all over the U.S. Most importantly, the company itself has had this really positive impact on these international communities, getting to know the growers, giving back to the people in the land in which they're working with. You'll sense the heart and soul with every word that Brendan shares. This is one quality guy. In the interview, we get into a bunch of fun stuff, but including a philosophy of his, which is called Book the Ticket, how to take that leap and then just figure it out out, how he grew his company from an initial investment of only $750. We talk about the best investment that you can ever make into your personal life and the lives of those around you and why solo travel is the key to personal transformation. Now, we're going to do something fun for this episode that we've never done before, and that is if you go to iTunes and write a review and mention this show, take a screenshot and send it my way to john at frontrowglobal.com. That's J-O-N at frontrowglobal.com. The first five posts, I'm going to send you personally a free bag of Utopian coffee and a front row mug. I want you sipping this coffee so that you can join the bliss that I experience almost every single day of my life. So a little something fun. Now on to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy my interview with none other than Brendan Maxwell of utopiancoffee.com. Ladies and gentlemen, Brendan Maxwell of Utopian Coffee. Do we've done two takes here on Skype. We We think we got it right, but man, I'm just excited that you're with me today. Can you go back and for the second time now, but for the first time, those listening, tell me a little bit about your life story, Brendan, and uh, and how we've gotten to this point now of utopia. Absolutely. Well, first of all, John, great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, really an honor. And as a, a longtime supporter and, and fan of Utopian, yeah, I'm just I'm happy to be here. So thank you. Yeah, won't won't bore you with all the details starting in 1983, but you know, born Fort Wayne, Indiana, 1983, and had a really fun upbringing. I was one of four boys, and um, just a great place to be raised. A town of 250, 300 thousand, roughly. A lot of fun. You know, got in got into uh, you know quite a bit of trouble when when you're one of four boys, both at the house and outside of that. But uh, we, we had a blast. And so, you know, went to a, a unique public school system that was focused on foreign language and fine arts. And that kind of plays into some things that, that uh, we got to do later in life, but grew up in a, in a really, you know, comfortable place and, and had great parents and really good family and friends. And so got to the point where in high school, I, I wasn't attending classes regularly, pretty pretty disenchanted with where I was, and my parents knew that something needed to change, ended up transferring to a private school for my last two years of high school. And it was a really good academic challenge, not not what I was looking for in terms of, you know, socioeconomic diversity, but uh, but a really neat opportunity that, that laid some groundwork for some things. And in that time in, in high school, started a couple of small ventures. The first thing we started doing, part of that that boredom, um, allowed for some ingenuity and, and us to focus on other things. Uh, but we started buying dumb dumb suckers uh, when I was 16, 15 or 16, and bu- buying dumb dumb suckers from the bulk section of a candy store. 
uh, or grocery store rather. And so we would, you know, buy them, fill them up in our backpack and go to school and sell them the next day. Well, we quickly sold out of those, I think in the first day or two. And so we did a little excursion in a five mile radius and bought up as many dumb, dumb suckers as we could from the, the bulk section of the grocery stores and started separating them and, and found that that could be a pretty pretty decent way to make a little bit of money. And and so we ended up finding a distributor of Spangler Candy Company in Ohio who manufactures Dum Dums. And we were selling them two for 25 cents or 10 for a dollar. Um, it, it was a great lesson in, on so many levels, but certainly a nice little business lesson. We had to calculate margin and, and you know, there were certain flavors that were that were much better sellers than others. So we knew that we had to bundle, uh, you know, your lemons and, and, you know, some other flavors that weren't going to be as good. Great. That's awesome. With, uh, <laughs> yeah. It, it, you know, really looking back, there, there were some really good lessons that we certainly didn't know we were learning at the time, but you look back and wow, okay, yeah, there were there was some there was some fruit there, there was some value to that. Um, so it, it was really neat. But I think that was the first opportunity that that I experienced that allowed me to see that if we were willing to be creative and work hard, that there was there was some freedom in that. And so, you know, I had a, a couple of companies after that. We had a car detailing, power washing, kind of a, a state management company called the Cleanagers. And we did that for two or three summers. By the third summer, we had six employees and did that into that was into college, actually. But even before that, I mean, just coming up with creative things, we had a metal frame built and we went and got high grade stencils and, and really good paint and went door to door in my grandparents' neighborhood and sold the service of spray painting the house number on the curb for five dollars a piece. And, you know, we did did really well with those sorts of things. No way. I didn't know all this about you, man. <laughs> well, there's, you know, there, there's a little backstory to, uh, to you this know. This is cool. It wasn't just coffee, John. Not just coffee. That's right. Um, so, you know, these were some of the things that, that allowed me at an early stage. And fortunately, we had, you know, parents that were supportive of us thinking outside of the box a little bit. And, you know, as long as we were not asking them for money and we weren't being irresponsible, uh, they were encouraging of it. So, you know, we had some really good lessons. Our grandfather, so a couple of these things I did with my cousin, and that will come into play as we talk about Utopian Coffee. But um, our grandfather was an entrepreneur and, and a real trailblazer in his his field of photography. He was one of the first in the tri-state region there, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, uh, Indiana, uh, to invest in color photography and did very, very well as a result of that. And so he was always very encouraging of us, you know, sort of thinking outside of the box and taking some risk, which, you know, has then you know, allowed for set the stage for us to do, you know, different endeavors like that. So, and that is so great. Yeah. Dude, I would guess that you were entrepreneurial, but that those stories have never come up for us. Dude, as a parent, I can't help but ask this question. And I should mention, hopefully there aren't people that don't know this yet, or I, I'm not letting the cat out of the bag, but, uh, but you are expecting with your beautiful wife. And that's true. So as a future parent, dude, you know, do you think this is something that do you, are you born with this? Is it, is it, is it an environmental thing? Like your friends did it. So you did it. Is it something that your parents created because at a very early age, they asked, how do you want to be entrepreneurial? You know, it's, it's a great question. I think honestly, the argument could be made for both sides and I would be able to both make the argument for both and, and defend, you know, the, the other. And so it's hard. I think so much of it is an ecosystem though. I think that it can be created. I think like most things, there are probably, you know, genetic predispositions toward that. I mean, I think that I had a, a desire to do something different. I think I had a, you know, a willingness to have a certain risk threshold that maybe was a little bit higher than others. Uh, but I think ultimately, had that been, you know, squelched or, or qua you know, just kind of uh, slammed down that we we would not have had, you know, the opportunities and the experiences that we did. So I, I think there there is at least an, an argument to be made for for a healthy balance of both. 
but but I think that the ecosystem and the environment in which we were raised is is a big part of it. And and so you know as as you mentioned, you know my wife is pregnant. We're due to give birth uh, in in June, and that will be our first child. And and so we're really excited about that. And obviously having conversations and and all kinds of wonderful you know articulations around this idea of how, what do we want our child to be able to do and to experience and to see and and a lot of that I think has to do with um, really keeping an open mind as it is as it you know pertains to the idea of what do we want our child to be who do we want them to be and you know I think parents that say you know our child is going to be a doctor but maybe that's not what your kid wants to be so you know we really want to be open to their leanings and so I think a big part of uh, that conversation John and, and that question that you asked is is the environment in creating and and um just a forum for that ability to to explore those ideas, and especially, you know, whether it's a lemonade stand when there's a you know a, a neighborhood garage sale going on, or you know selling dum dum suckers or going door to door and and helping people out with a service, you know whether it's mowing lawns or something else. I think that that can be encouraged, and if nothing else, gives them an idea of whether or not that's something they want to do down the road and explore on a on a greater level. Mm, so cool. It's, I catch myself sometimes saying, I want my boys to be whatever they want to be. And I want them to be themselves 100%. As long as they don't do these things. <laughs> and as long as right, they, and right. so it's funny. It's like, I want them to be whatever they want. As long as they don't venture outside of these boundaries. I have, I have yeah. to catch myself with that. Brendan, talk, that, bring us to uh, right now, today. What's the highlight? Give us a highlight reel of what's going on. You've got this amazing company. You're doing big things, and you're you're doing a great job of mixing passion and purpose. And you've got a real awesome thing going in your life right now. Tell me about what's shaking. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate the kind words. You know, we've been incredibly blessed, and you know, we started a coffee roasting company officially in August of '06. It was a total side project. We had seven hundred and fifty dollars that we began with, and really about as grassroots as you can get. And you know, we slowly built it up. I mean, the first two years, it was just a side project. And, you know, really, we're trying to wade through the waters and, and figure out what we were doing. I had lived in Silicon Valley in 2004. I was taking some classes out there and, and really became fascinated with the web startup world and and really company culture and, and how employers out there were treating their employees and really liked that model. And so I called my cousin one day and said, hey, what would you think of a you know web-based coffee company and he said yeah that sounds interesting so we kicked around the idea in 2005 and then finally in 06 we began as i mentioned very grassroots and so the first two years we were just you know figuring out what we wanted to do and then in 2008 we worked with our city fort wayne and in indiana and got an economic development loan used that to buy our own roaster moved into an old warehouse that had abandoned space essentially it looked like a prison cell when we first went in there we you know swept and cleaned and painted and built walls and turned it into our, our first little home which was amazing and that's the same time that we started a wholesale division so we were roasting for cafes businesses churches restaurants and um, still doing the online thing and then we grew into kind of who we were and and started doing some corporate gifting as well, financial advising firms, insurance brokerages, really anyone that was gifting to their employees, clients, vendors, that sort of thing. So, yeah, that was uh, 2010, and then we, you know, really just started focusing on on who we were in, in a, you know, what is by definition a commodity, coffee. Um, you know, who who are we and how do we separate ourselves? And, you know, my desire and the, the way that I got into this to begin with was through overseas travel. And when I was younger, my brother moved overseas. And so I started traveling to visit him in, in different locations throughout the world and just absolutely fell in love with it. So my cousin was the, the coffee guy. Um, I had some business experience, but my real passion was, was international traveling. And so we tried to figure out a way to combine all of those. And that, that's the idea 
idea behind not just the, the name, but the ethos of Utopian Coffee. So the idea that we are creating Utopia, a better place at both ends of the coffee spectrum. So yes, of course, at the end where you, know, you John, and, and your wife and, and family get to enjoy a great cup of coffee Saturday morning with your feet kicked up reading the newspaper, but also at the beginning part of that story at Coffee Origin in Central America, South America, Southeast Asia, East Africa, where people are working very hard uh, uh, to support their families by, you know, cultivating this crop that we get to enjoy. And so that, that's been a big part of our heart and mission as a company since we first began was to give back to these countries of origin. And so I've spent some really great time recently. I was in East Africa at the end of the summer in Rwanda and Congo. I was in Guatemala in the fall before that. And, you know, this year we'll be headed either to Brazil or Papua New Guinea, where we're establishing some other relationships. And as we grow, you know, our desire is to be farm direct with every coffee that we're selling and really come alongside and tell the story of the farmers. And, you know, we get to work with this uh, female owned co op in Rwanda, and I get to go and have lunch with a couple of them and really just, you know, ask them about their lives. And, and it's so powerful to, to get to hear what they're doing and, and just ask how we can be a part of their journey. You know, not tell them what they need, not, you know, try to, uh, you know, be imperialistic with it, but really come alongside and, and, you know, just be a part of their story. So it's, it's really been an honor. Wow, it's so fun. I love the idea. First of all, I love when you ask the question, how can we combine all of these? You're talking about these passions for travel and you said your cousin was the coffee guy, right? Yes, correct. So you're just asking, how do we mix all of our passions and and purpose together? So did you suggest the web-based coffee company knowing that he was into coffee? Like that was his passion? Yes. So he was already roasting coffee Uh, at the time that I called him. So Yes, that was the intent. That's great. I think there's power in partnerships. There's no in no doubt that when we, I have a note on my wall that says build with friends. And I'm always asking, nice. like, what are my strengths and uh, how do I combine those with my friends' strengths so that we can go build something together? Like, I really just want an excuse to hang out with all my friends. So <laughs> right, we, right. we do all these things. So it's like, really, it's all secondary. It's like, hey, we need an excuse to hang out. So let's start a coffee company. <laughs> let's, we need an excuse to hang out. Let's, uh, let's give and do it together. So we'll start Front Row Foundation. You know, it's all, I love it's it. all about combining uh, strengths coming together and building with friends. I think that's really cool. Dude, tell me a little bit about uh, your, your back row to front row experiences of life. Um, you know, take us to one or a few. I think I, I know one that we've talked about before that uh, I'd love for you to talk about that the trip to New Zealand and Australia. But I'd love to know a little bit about, and I know that our listeners want to know about people's transformation. How do they go from, you know, life over here to life over there? And whether you could call that back row or front row, because sometimes people, they go, I was never back row. I was never really totally in a, I mean, if you're selling dum-dums in school, you're not really back row. <laughs> like, but, but, we, but we can move up a seat or we can get closer or we can do something with even more courage or get more in tune or more present to our purpose and, and our life. But I don't know, just uh, share with us uh, one of your favorite stories. Great. Well, I think that, you know, before I get too far into a story, because I can get into that and then forget where I was going with it, I want to address the the question that you asked. And I think the way that someone can do that, the most meaningful way is when when you're presented, we're all going to be presented with opportunities. And I think the ones that push you outside of your comfort zone, I, I literally, I have a, I have some daily reminders that come up on my email and I just have them. They're calendar notes that are set. I think one day in, in each week, it says something different. But one of them is do something uncomfortable today. And, and the idea behind that is that it's, it's going to push me to grow. And so I think we're all going to have opportunities that we're presented with that, that may be uncomfortable to us at first thought or first glance. But when you say yes to those, that's really where, you know, my greatest memories have come from and, and my greatest opportunities, um, you know, going to, and this will then lead into that story that you were talking about, the idea of going to Australia and New Zealand by myself for two months, not knowing anyone, never having been there, um, was sort of a, a, a bit intimidating and nerve wracking. So I'm going to fly to a place by myself at 20, what was I, 22 years old. 
And I have no idea what I'm going to do there. I, I don't have places lined up to stay. Uh, but, you know, I think I think that it will be good. This has been a, a desire of mine for a long time. I like the idea of Australia. And, and so, you know, let's take a backpack and go. And so that's what I did the same day I finished my, my final exams in college. I took a backpack. And, you know, once you book the ticket, it just feels like it's locked in. So that was always kind of my key. Look, I'm just going to book the ticket and not think about it. And then when it comes, I'll, I'll make a little bit more of a plan. So went to Australia and I showed up and it turns out that before, after I'd booked the ticket, I found out that a friend from middle school and high school was actually living in Sydney. And I reached out to her and she offered to let me, you know, crash at their place for a couple of days and get my start. And then once I got on the ground, I was just figuring it out. I took a a car up the, up the coast and ended up doing a, a diving course. I'd always wanted to be scuba certified. So went all the way up a road trip. I found a ticket at a hostel for a girl who was looking for someone to join her and split gas money. And so we took this car all the way up the coast and went to Cairns and did a, you know, five day diving course out on the Great Barrier Reef. And you just had some really amazing adventures. And, and I then flew to New Zealand and was doing a two week adventure tour on the South Island of New Zealand and was really interested in the idea of paragliding. It was kind of intimidating. I, I don't particularly like heights, but again, for the same reason, I, I just said yes to that opportunity. And I was flying, we were about a thousand feet up in the air. And if you look this up on Google, you'll see, you know, a, a hint of, of how amazing it is, but they're called the Incredibles mountain range. And the sun was hitting in such a way it shines uh, just a, a vibrant, you know, variant of lights uh, on the the mountaintops that are snow capped, and so these amazing, brilliant purples and pinks and reds and oranges, and so we were about a thousand feet up in the air, my feet dangling, flying around for twenty, almost twenty five minutes, and it was really at that moment I had kind of this epiphany and said, okay, I've got to figure out a way for this to continue, and so I need to find another creative solution that gives me you know, some freedom to be able to do this or figure out a way to combine this passion of traveling where we can do it in a meaningful way and, and add value to the marketplace. And so, you know, I think those are just a couple of ways that, uh, that opportunities presented themselves and, and I said yes to it. Uh, maybe a little bit nervous, not really knowing where it was going to go, but, but the end result was, was incredible. Mm, that's so cool. Brendan, I, I, I got to go back to <laughs> just book the ticket. Dude, when you said that, like, I got chills over my body because I'm like, that's so many times people want to know, how do you create a front row life? And yeah. I think in so many ways, the answer is just book the ticket. Absolutely. Right. You, like you'll figure out the rest later, but just book the ticket. I had a friend who did uh, travel similar to what you're talking about. I remember the feeling I had when they were explaining it years ago of, wow, that's such courage you know, to, to just go by yourself. This person uh, backpacked through Thailand and all over with, uh, you know, no agenda, just flew and said, I'll figure it out when I get there. And I thought that was so amazing. And I have another friend who's, who, uh, you may know Carl Drew. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, of course. From Indiana, Absolutely, right? Absolutely. He is. And, uh, and so Carl, our, our mutual friend who's a mountain climber and adventurer, he'll always say, don't wait to get things perfect before you get them going, just get them going and then worry about, you know, whether or not you get it perfect later, but just get it going. So Brendan, I, I want to talk about, I, I really want to talk, uh, I want to dig, keep digging into this mission of utopian coffee and your life. And I, what I'm obsessed about right now is mixing passion profits and purpose. You know, this idea that you can do good and do well. And, and I don't even know who to quote for that, but I read that somewhere. And, and I have some real, some of my favorite books, you know, The Purpose Economy, uh, Conscious Capitalism, Firms of Endearment, this idea that you can do good and do well in the world. And this idea of finding out how to create, and we live in a world now where you can really sh create almost your perfect job, your perfect life, your perfect role, your perfect mission. So dude, what, I, I don't even know where to go with that question, but I almost want to just leave it open-ended and say, dude, what thoughts do you have around this? How can people create this in your life? How have you created this in your life? Yeah. You know, I, I, I have no perfect uh, answer for this because I think that a lot of it goes back to that idea of just saying yes to the opportunities, right? Just just book the ticket, just say yes when it when it may be a little uncomfortable. And so I can't go back to a time where I was, 
you know, just kind of uh, saying, look, this is how the next 10 years are going to play out and this is how we backtrack and do it. I think a lot of that, if, if you start with that vision, though, that a lot of those opportunities present themselves. And, and that's what it was for us. I mean, I knew that I wanted to continue traveling internationally. I also knew that I, you know, maybe had some, some skill sets or at least a, an, an interest and desire to do business. And when we first started doing this, this was back in 04, 05, when we were thinking about this, that was probably a little bit on the, the beginning side. I mean, Tom's hadn't come out and some of these other companies that we, we now know as being, you know, really socially aware and doing, you know, philanthropic activities in the context of for-profit companies. And so, you know, now I think that being a little bit more on the radar and people being more intentional about it and outspoken about it makes that a little bit easier to think about or to study at least uh, looking at other companies. Um, But really, I think it's just about assessing, you know, who you are, what your passions are, and then, and then starting to look for ways that those can come together. And, and again, as you mentioned, don't let it be perfect. You know, I think that, it, that if we're waiting for that, it's, it's not going to come. Um, and just really diving in. And, you know, when we first did it, we didn't have the budget. I mean, we had $750. I didn't pay myself for years. We didn't have the, the budget just to hop on a plane and, and, you know, go overseas and, you know, meander around and, and see how we could help. But we, we started anyway. And we started by saying, you know what, we can partner with an organization that is doing good things overseas and we, we can contribute to what they're doing until we can get to the point where we're flying to Rwanda to, you know, know, work with these women directly and and help create something sustainable. And so I think that the biggest key is just start, just jump in, just book the ticket and and look for those opportunities to to make meaningful impact. And again, I think it can be anywhere and it may not look the same, right? I mean, the the story that that you're helping me tell is one that that maybe is is a little bit easier to tell or maybe a little more sexy that you know oh flying around the world and and you know creating uh, meaningful relationships with these you know people overseas but but the reality is it can, it can happen locally i mean it can happen in your neighborhood and and so I, I don't want there to be this you know mistaken perspective that it has to be overseas it has to be on a grand scale really it can be you know helping your neighbor out or you know getting your employees together on a united way you know day of giving you know something like that that's still contributing in a positive way to whatever your sphere of influence is and i think you know that's really important to you know to to be bold and take some risks but but also know where you're called to be and i think you know there are people you know when when, you, when it comes to adoption there are people that are that are called to adopt from overseas uh, there are people that are called to adopt from their backyard right so this idea that uh, do do whatever is is comfortable for you or kind of the first step and maybe it starts locally and then it goes regional and then you know national and then global so you know uh, but i think that the real key is just to start to find those opportunities to look for them uh, because if you're looking for them if you're trying to create them they will come no doubt and then really just say yes mm. it's awesome stuff brendan i love it man it's uh it's so cool i can just imagine that people are listening right now getting fired up about their future <laughs> and what's possible and what they can do i hope so what are your thoughts on paying attention to the clues uh looking for the opportunities being mindful of you know these feelings and emotions how does somebody develop that? How have you developed that over time? That's a great question. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that we've been talking about recently, you know, in, internally in our company and, you know, my wife and I and, and I trying to be intentional. And so I think even thinking intentionally is is really important. The idea that I'm going to say, okay, I, I want to look for these opportunities. Part of it is, you know, where would I look? And again, if it's an opportunity to to give back, okay, well, where are the needs? Why don't I start thinking about or looking at or talking to someone who is familiar with the needs? 
of this community, whatever that is. If it's, you know, my my local town or if I'm really drawn to, you know, East Africa, who who, who do I know that may be familiar with that region, with that area? Where, where can I, you know, look to do that? Um, so I think being intentional in, in thought is is really important. And then again, going back and, and just saying, okay, and you talked about the emotions a little bit. There are certain things that you're going to get kind of a similar emotion, um, and you've got to be able to discern this. Obviously, if something is you know illegal, you're, you're about to do something that is illegal or inappropriate, you're going to get a certain emotion that is you know evoked. That that is not what we're talking about here. These are not the risks that I am encouraging. But I think that there is there is a discomfort, there is a little unsettling of the the spirit of the soul that comes when when you know getting prepared to embark or even that the idea of doing something you know not probably too dissimilar to getting ready to you know jump out of a plane skydiving i mean you're nervous you're questioning whether you should be doing this and you know you should you made the decision when you were of rational mind you're up there now and you just need to jump and when you do i mean it's an incredible rush and so you have this amazing experience and and I think it's like that and you have to be able to discern some of those emotions but I think that real key is when you're uncomfortable assuming it's not you know uh, of some illicit you know means but but when you are uncomfortable when your your spirit is kind of pushed when you feel like this is no longer inside of your box that's when you need to say yes to those opportunities Brendan have you ever wanted to just throw in the towel and quit have there been such rough moments along the way here that you just wanted that you questioned the whole thing and said, "Dude, what did I sign up for? What am I doing?" Absolutely, absolutely, on, on more than one occasion. Yeah, how do you work past that? You know, I, th- I think again that that's that's the moment where you're you're up in the plane and you're nervous, right? And you have to say, "Okay, but but what 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 did the rational me think? How did I get here?" Right? When when I made the decision to get here. It was for for a variety of things. It was because I wanted some some freedom, mostly temporal. And so you have to go back to that place where you made the decisions. And I think most often, you know, when we're in our rational place, we make the right decisions at at the right time. And it can be daunting. And and when you have poured, you know, years of, of energy and business development and meetings and conversations and all of those things, and they're not quite yielding what you want, it can be discouraging. And, and yes, it would be much more comfortable to be able to get a consistent paycheck every two weeks. But the, the reality is that is that is not where I am, you know, the best Brendan that I can be. And, and that's not where I am going to see the most growth. And I don't feel like that's probably where I can add the most value to an organization. And so I think you have to go back and, and really just assess, you know, what, what got me here? Um, and that's not to say that you can't change course. Um, that's not to say that you should stay in, you know, what you're doing indefinitely when, when the signs are, are not pointing there. But I think they, you have to get back to, you know, kind of the rational part of you and, and say, you know, what got me here? And, and were those all good decisions? And, and if they were, then, then know that you're in the right place. And, and there, there is a time for, for perseverance. And I've, I'm fortunate that in those moments, we, we didn't back out, that, that we did make the jump and that we continued on, on the journey. And then I, I also think there are some times and whether it's, you know, with a division of a company that you've created or, or a decision that you have, have made, even within the context of, you know, being an employee in a, in a company saying, you know what, th- this wasn't the right role for me to accept, or this wasn't the right path for us to walk down. We're, we're making investments into this and, and that's just not the way we want to go. I think there's no, no harm in backtracking. I mean, there, there is, you know, no failure in that sense. I mean, failure is only if you haven't learned from the experience. So I think making sure that, you know, if you go down a trail that, that doesn't produce what you're hoping, what, what can you learn from that and, and how can you make it better the next time? Mm. 
It's great. What I hear is, you know, when you think about what got me here, it's remembering also the values that you were chasing, the the dream that you had, the why behind your mission. Sometimes when we get lost in the chaos and the confusion and the uncertainty, we have to go back and say, what? why did I do this to begin with? And are those things still present? Like you said, is that still true? And if it is, yeah. then you get to realign and refocus. That's great. Absolutely. Brendan, when we talk about the front row factor, this is all about proximity. It's all about what are we close to in our lives? The, you know, the, the first part is the person, the mind, body, spirit of an individual. The second part is, you know, it's, who are they keeping in their front row? Both who are they cheering on? You know, whose front row are they in? And who's in their front row? Who's cheering them on? Here's cheer, who's cheering you on, right? So these are these are critical. And then there's also, of course, the environment that we're in. It's it's the physical environment that affects our world. It's like what you talk about when you did the solo trip to New Zealand and Australia. You shift your environment. You shift your perspective. You can have these breakthroughs. You can live life in the front row. Talking about who's in your front row first and the proximity to people. Dude, how important are relationships in your life? What do you feel about relationships? You know, what advice, like if I said, what's one piece of advice that you would give our listeners around relationships? And I can say, you're a relationship guy. Like you're awesome at building great relationships. Dude, what advice would you have for us on that subject of who's in your front row in life? Mm, that's a great question, John. You know, my, my wife and I were coming home from a, a dinner last night and we were having a, a conversation and, and, it, and I want to start with this and I'll probably end with it in some capacity. But if you were going to invest heavily in, in one thing in life, don't let it be your 401k. Don't let it be your business. Let it be meaningful relationships because that is hands down where where the most, you know, for the most value has come in my life that is certainly going to be the best ROI you can ever get. And, and again, I say meaningful. I think when we're, we're younger, you sort of have friends by proximity, whatever that may be, because you went to school with them, because they grew up in your neighborhood. And so I think even, you know, reassessing some of those relationships at, at different junctures in life, um, you're, you're, your college drinking buddies may not be the same guys that you're going to develop, you know, meaningful relationships with into your, you know, parenting years and, and beyond. And so I think, though, that, you know, going back to mine in particular, I think it really started with my parents. My parents were always huge uh, supporters and, and advocates of us. And, you know, they were also the first to, if we got into a little trouble, when we got into a little trouble in school, they they were standing alongside the teachers and making sure that that we were held accountable for what we did or didn't do. And and I think a big part of that is important as well because we knew that we were held to a certain standard, uh, but we also knew that in unjust times that they would be you know advocating for us. And so you know my parents were were huge hugely important in that, and especially in the entrepreneurial journey um, when. You start with seven hundred and fifty dollars. You don't have a lot of extra spending money, and my parents knew what we were trying to create and build, and and they were willing to you know let me stay at the house probably beyond what what a you know was was normally be appropriate for for a, a young adult rent free, and and they really you know were just supportive of that. Now, had we been you know playing video games all day and you know staying in the basement they probably wouldn't have allowed that but but they knew what we were trying to do and they wanted to support that so i think that is you know first and foremost where it came from but i don't think if you you know that's not to say that if you didn't have supportive parents if you didn't have great parents that that you can't you know have those those people in your front row. Um, I think that now the, the best example of that is is my wife, and and I think that's really important to to find a partner who is going to support you and and that, that seeks to know you and and who you are at the core. Um, I mean, my wife is incredible, and she knows that my my lifestyle is a little bit crazy, and we talked about that. And, and again, going back to intentional conversations and investments and relationships, we talked about that pretty early on. And I told her, "Look, Carly, this you know my my traveling internationally. This is not young wanderlust. This is this is who I am. This is my passion. This is what I feel called to do." And she said, okay, that's great. And, and she supports that. I mean, 
you know, at the end of the summer, I had to go to East Africa for two weeks. And one of those countries is a very dangerous country. And, you know, she is absolutely on board for it. Um, I, I have to fly, you know, on short notice sometimes around the country and incredibly supportive. And, and so I think, you know, finding the right relationships, not only in your, you know, kind of lifelong partnership but also in your friends is incredibly important. So the conversation we were having last night on the way home from dinner, I asked her, I said, hey, who would you say are your, your two closest you know, friends right now, the, the two inve- relationships that are most meaningful to you? And what is the one that you want to invest in you know, most this year? And again, just trying to be intentional and trying to think about those things because some of that doesn't come by accident, right? Like we, as we talked about before, and I, I don't want to overuse this, but John, going back to book the ticket, right? That that doesn't just come about. The ticket's not coming to us. We have to go take that action. We have to book the ticket. And so we have to be intentional in these relationships. And you know, there are a couple guys right now that, that I'm trying to be pretty intentional with, and um, they're just cut from the same cloth and and we have great conversations and they're willing to challenge me and and encourage me and and you know really just having a couple of confidants that you can call when on those days that we talked about where you do want to quit and you do want to stop um, when things are hard you know you need a couple people in your corner and I've been really fortunate to uh, to have a number of those that's a, that's great man I love this uh, I love the question you know who's the one person that you would want to invest in the most this year? That's a question that everybody listening could take and run with and ask Ask your three closest friends that question. You know, if there's one person, they might feel obligated to say you, but right. <laughs> uh, you could say aside from present company, you know, who is the one person that you'd want to invest in most this year? You know, it's interesting to also ask, you know, how do we help our friends hit their biggest dreams and goals? But it's a whole other level of relationship when you ask, how can you help your best friend's friend hit their dreams and goals? You start to add value at that level. And that's also, that's unique and different, I think, than how most people operate. Absolutely. Takes it a little deeper. That's great. Brendan, when it comes to, but when it comes to the point of what's in your front row, shaping your environment, what advice would you have for people about, crafting and creating an environment, excluding of just people. I get that, you know, people in your environment is a big key, but outside of the people, this is literally your physical environment. It's the stuff you hang up on your walls. It's what you're in proximity to. It's calendars. It's, you know, it's all the things that you see, experience, feel that affect you. It might be working location. What thought would you have? What's your best tip on shaping a powerful environment to thrive in? Yeah, I think that's a great question. It's really important. One that I didn't know was was coming this morning, but one that I have thought about a lot over the years, especially as a, a young entrepreneur with no money. We we initially, you know, were working from home, and that wasn't always the the best environment in which to thrive. So, you know, there are all kinds of distractions there: the the kitchen, your your bed when you are tired, you know, various other things, and so. One one of the ways that we you know tried to accomplish this was just by getting a, a little office space, even when we couldn't quite afford it. I thought that it would be important enough to have a good working environment, and so we I got a small office inside of actually another company, which which worked really well. They were happy to have a little extra income, and it was space that they hadn't quite grown into yet. And I was thrilled to be around other people and just the energy of people working as opposed to being in an empty apartment or empty house, you know, by myself all day. So I think that's part of it, just getting around, you know, some good working energy. And as you talked about, you know, things on the walls, you know, whether it's, you know, pictures of why you're working, whether it's, you know, your your wife and kids, whether it's a, a, a woman in Rwanda who, you know, has a vision and, and a mission that you're you're trying to help Accomplish. I mean, all of those things are on the walls at our building. Now we have a, a cool little space. We have an old 1905 brick and steel truss building that's been redone on the inside. And it's just a really warm, welcoming environment. We took our pallet wood that our coffee gets shipped in on and took that down and sanded it and stained it and put it on the walls and, you know, really just tried to create a kind of an ethos of, of who we are 
and and what we want people to feel when they walk in. And we don't have traditional brick and mortar, uh, but it was still important to us to invest in that environment. It would have been a lot easier and cheaper to get you know an industrial space that was closer to a highway, um, but that's not who we wanted to be, both you know externally and internally. We wanted a place where you know company culture is very important to us. So we wanted a place where you know our our team can go out and you know walk to get a, a great lunch or a really nice happy hour at the end of the day, something like that nearby, and and that doesn't come from just you know kind of going out into the industrial complex, which would have been, you know, easier and cheaper. And so again, I think going back to being intentional, thinking about what you want the environment to be like, and as it pertains to, you know, even the outdoors. So right now I I work part of, of the year from Southern California and, you know, it is January and, you know, hopefully no one gets offended by this, but, you know, I'm born and and raised in the Midwest. I love it, but the, the winters there are not so great. I think it was negative two with wind chill yesterday and it'll be, you know, 65 and sunny here today. So, you know, part of that again is, is just deciding what you want to be as, as your environment and part of your life. And I don't know how long this season will last. We, you know, are now pregnant and, and going to have a child that may take us back to the Midwest, but, you know, just, just making some, some choices like that and in your environment. And if you find that you're stagnant in a place, you know, figure out what you can do to, to make some changes, whether it's a, a new picture on the wall, whether it's painting your walls, your favorite color, on um, whether it's getting a new desk, building your own desk, you know, doing something at, at any budget. And trust me, you, you can't get smaller than $750 from building a company. So at any budget, you can make these things happen. And I, I'm really encouraging of, of just making the best environment possible. Maybe you can't move to, you know, the, the sunny beach, but but you can definitely make your office space better or, you know, get into an office space outside of your home, whatever that is. And I, I would definitely encourage that for the best working environment. Brendan, imagine this. It's a contest called Book Your Ticket. (laughs) And you put a ticket inside one of the coffee bags. And if somebody gets it, it's like Willy Wonka's golden ticket. You get a trip to Utopian headquarters. Dude, when you were painting the picture of your whole setup there, I was like, I got to get there. I want (laughs) to, dude, I want to do happy hour at the end of the day with the Utopian crew. So, dude, that's, uh, what, what an awesome, What an awesome environment you've created for yourself in your life and those you care about. It's really nice. Great, great thoughts. Brendan, I want to take it in a different direction now. I know that we're, uh, dude, we're, 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 we're nearing the end. I can't believe that we've been on the, you know, this is 45 minutes in. I can't believe it. But dude, that's how it goes when you talk to awesome people. It goes by in the blink of an eye. When you think about your life and you think about the end of your life, you know, how do you deal with death in your, in, you know, and have you explored this subject? How do you deal with it? Uh, does it inspire you, terrify you, all of the above thoughts on death? Wow, that is a great question. It does not terrify me. And, you know, so I, I mentioned earlier in the conversation, my, my grandfather, who was a, a pretty big inspiration in my life, and we got to be very close over the years. And he died about a year and a half ago now. And I was so grateful he got to be at our wedding. And and he died at 97. And the stories that he had, I mean, he grew up just dirt poor in New Jersey. And his father died when he was five. And, you know, he, he has these just amazing stories. He was in World War II. And and became a he was a photographer during the war and ended up being stationed at Bearfield in Indiana and that's where he met my grandmother and that's how you know we ended up in Indiana but but these incredibly inspiring stories and and I just got to be a part of those stories through the years and and you know he loved to make people laugh and and he loved to make people feel good about themselves and and so it was really a, a neat opportunity to see and, and be part of, of that life for so long. And, you know, and he died very gracefully at, at 97 and was still, you know, making jokes all, all the way to the end. And so I, I'm not afraid of it. I think, you know, what, what fear I have is, is the idea of getting old and the idea of not being able to do meaningful things. And, and, and I think I see, 
you know, that in some, some people. Um, and so, you know, death while still here is much more scary to me than, than just death and being gone. And that's what, what I'm trying to avoid. And, you know, I think depending on your, your worldview and, and, you know, kind of your, your stance, I mean, you know, for me, you know, my faith is very important to me. And, and so death is not something that, that I, I fear in any way. In terms of you know the the afterlife, but but again, what, what I would call death while still here, death while alive, is is sort of a a scary thing, and I think that goes back to choice. I think we have the the option of whether or not we're we're going to truly live or or just be here, and um, yeah. So I, I think ultimately it's a it's a choice, and and we we can affect that. You know, we we can change that if if you are in that place right now where you're just dragging by and you're you're going to the job that is that is not fulfilling you have the choice and whether it's a, a choice in your shift of attitude and in you know having you know just a grateful heart for for the job that you have or whether it's starting to explore and figure out hey how can I take my passion and bring that into my workplace whether it's starting a company or going to find a company where I can be meaningfully engaged we have the choice and and, and I choose to live. It's awesome, man. Good choice. What does living life in the front row mean to you? You know, I think we've been kind of talking about it through this, this whole conversation, but, but it, it is saying yes to opportunities. And, and I find myself being so enriched by these. And, and, you know, what I found the most though, so the thing that I didn't talk about that that trip to Australia and New Zealand was amazing on so many levels, and it and it grew me. And part of the way was that it it grew me because it was the first trip by myself internationally. Uh, but one thing that I found out about myself when I was there that the experiences weren't nearly as rich when they weren't shared with people that were meaningful. And and I think that that was in 2005. I think that I made the decision at that point that, that I really wanted those adventures to be with, you know, other people and to be able to share in them with others. And it was just so much more valuable. And and that goes back to what we were talking about in terms of being intentional and investing in relationships. And so, you know, in 2007, uh, my brother and I had been talking about this trip for a while. We were going to go to Asia and backpack through Asia for two and a half months. And I had already booked my ticket. We had no plans, but I had booked the ticket. And he called me and said, hey, I don't think I'm going to be able to go. You know, some things have happened, you know, financially, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't have much money at the time at all. And I just said, you know what? I don't want to look back on this in five or 10 years and say that we didn't do it because of a thousand dollars. And so this could be, you know, borderline irresponsible, but, uh, put it on the credit card and said, look, we'll, we'll pay it off later. And that trip was hands down the most incredible two and a half months I've ever had. My brother and I became extremely close through a number of circumstances there. And it was just an amazing adventure. And so, you know, going back to your question, John, I think, you know, what living life in the front row is at least for me is just saying yes, creating opportunities to invest in people, to invest in your dreams, to to take your passion and and you know really live it out. So cool, man! I when you we were talking about this idea of that your know, happiest moments are those when you're sharing it with meaningful people. I, I went right back to uh, Into the Wild. Uh, have you seen that movie? <laughs> Oh yeah. Happiness uh happiness is only real when shared, correct? Is that yeah, that was the absolutely. line. Absolutely. And I love that. So, you know, in Front Row Foundation, that's the the spirit of it. Shared experiences. And uh that's that's the essence I think of life is is sharing experiences and then being able to document and tell those stories for years to come is is equally as fun. Agreed. What's one thing, Brennan, that you would share with our community that they should go do in the next 24 hours to live a front row life? You know, for me, and so if drawing from my experiences, I would say go and, and, you know, kind of fill in the blank to whatever fits your life. Go get outside of your comfort zone, get outside of your, your day-to-day experience. That might be, you know, driving an hour away. That might be, you know, camping, 
That might be going to visit a, a small little town that you've always been interested in. That might be going to New York City. And that might be booking the ticket to a country you've always wanted to go to. But I would just really encourage you today to, to think about well, what is that one thing, what is that one place you've always been interested in? It could be, you know, if you're a, a craft beer drinker, it could be a brewery that you have always wanted to visit. It could be a, you know, a manufacturing facility that, that you're just fascinated by. But I would really encourage you to, to book the ticket. And even if it isn't a flight, you know, make the plan, lock it in, go today and just, just have an adventure. And I think that, you know, those things spawn opportunities and you see how enjoyable they can be. If possible, take someone that, that you can laugh with and that you love. Have that shared experience together. But but even if it's by yourself, I mean, just, just find an opportunity to go somewhere and do something that you have always wanted to do that you haven't let yourself do up to this point. So listeners, this is your challenge. Next 24 hours, your job should you accept this adventure request for adventure is book the ticket, do something where you have to book the ticket, share it with Brendan and the front row community, hashtag book the ticket. <laughs> That's right. I love it. This is cool, man. Brendan, dude, thanks for spending so much time with us today. A couple things to, to wrap up here. One, I've got, I've got this one question, one answer, gut reaction to these questions round coming up in a second. But before we do, what's some, what's a dream that you are chasing right now and how can the front row community help you to get that dream? Wow. That is a, that's a phenomenal question. You know, my, my dreams, I'm, I'm always working toward them and, and, you know, working to, to try to achieve them and, and live them out. And I feel so fortunate that, that I get to do most of those things. And as we talked about before, a lot of my interests and passions, you know, revolve around relationships and, and traveling. And so, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that my, my brother gave us a, a wedding gift and we actually are, you know, just booked a ticket last week. We had no real solid plans, but we booked the ticket to go and visit him in Patagonia in Chile next month. So, you know, we're going to be going down there and that, that is a dream of, of my wife's. And so she wanted to go to Patagonia and we've been talking about it for a while. And, you know, I'm really grateful that with all that she does for me and, and all the trips that I get to take, that we get to go on one together and share in that experience. In terms of my dreams, you know, ultimately, I think it's just loving the people around me well. And it's easy for me to get kind of wrapped up in my own world and, and my business and my trips. And so, you know, I, I don't even know what to tell you, John, is, is my dream. But, but I, love, I love making other people's, you know, dreams. And so I guess I would kind of flip it back and, and say, look, the, the Front Row Foundation can, you know, figure out an opportunity that I can be meaningfully engaged in. And whether that's something that, you know, we can do as a company or, you know, someone that I can have a, a conversation with, I have no idea. But, you know, that's what would be, you know, meaningful to me is, is you know, how, how can we help you guys? What, what can we do? What can the front, what does the front row, you know, need right now that, that we can be meaningfully engaged in, in terms of, you know, a partnership, as we talked about before, I mean, being, you know, having shared experiences and, and doing them together. Well, what's something we can do together? Cause that, that would be, you know, a dream of mine. Oh, that's cool. I love it. I'm going to also suggest that everybody drink and share the coffee <laughs> as a way to, <laughs> as a way to support utopian, you know, and the mission that you're on, uh, which is a, a quality mission. And, uh, I would also suggest that people drink it because it's going to make you very, very happy. I speak from personal experience on that one. Brendan, uh, I, I want to do a little bit of a, of a rapid fire, uh, here with questions for you. Okay. That I want one word. Or one <laughs> sentence only. Okay, Th that is not my strong suit. If you've heard me talking today, but uh, but uh, I'll see what I can do. You're great, man. Gut reaction. Here we go. Ready? Aside from present company, when you think of somebody who's living life in the front row, who do you think of first? Gentleman named Thomas Kim. Awesome. Hopefully, he listens to this. When you order coffee, what's the usual for you? Espresso. What does it mean to be fully alive? One word or one sentence? Meaningfully engaged. What problem do you most want to solve in the world? 
lack of true love. Who are you a raving fan of? My wife. Who's your biggest fan? <laughs> My wife. What's you good good job. You passed. She asked me to ask you those questions today. <laughs> what's uh, what's the next place aside from Patagonia that you'd most like to travel? Papua New Guinea. What are the three things you're grateful for right now? My family, my business, and the the opportunities to uh, to just have have meaningful relationships. What is the first happy memory that you can recall? Wrestling with my oldest brother and my parents jumping off the couch onto my dad's back and uh, and having wrestle time. How old were you? Oh, probably three, four. What are you most proud of in life? Getting to know other people's stories. What's something fun that you've collected throughout your lifetime? <laughs> there, there are people that would chuckle right now. I actually used to be a big collector when I was young. I had a full spectrum of, of things, but, but I would say uh, coins. Coins, okay. And if your 20-year-old self walked into the room right now, met you today, what would they be most pleasantly surprised by? That he had gained some humility. Awesome. And final question, if you could be front row to any live event, any performance, anywhere around the world, and there has to be something you can see today, what would you want to go to? Ooh, that's great. Maybe... Maybe a Mumford and Sons concert. Ah, good choice. Well, Brendan, dude, that wraps up the questions for today. We're spot on with an hour here, and I wish I could talk to you for another hour. Dude, I so appreciate your wisdom that you shared with the group, the heart, the soul that you bring. Also, the poise to all of your conversations. You're just one cool dude. And I want to thank you for uh, for bringing all of the goods to the community today. Where do people go get more Brendan? Or maybe the better question is, where do they get the coffee? Absolutely. So you can get more coffee at utopiancoffee.com, U-T-O-P-I-A-N, coffee.com. We have one-off orders and we also have a, a subscription, which John has been on for a long time. Um, so we ship out to you every four weeks and you can either have it be a, a specific coffee or just the roaster's choice, whatever, you know, we're getting in new that month. We also do, you know, holiday gifts, Christmas gifts, any kind of, you know, opportunities that you need to ship to, you know, friends and family out of state. We do that. We ship all throughout the U.S. And so that's that's where you can get more of that. We also are, you know, Facebook.com uh, backslash Utopian Coffee. Same thing with Twitter, backslash Utopian Coffee. So all of those are, are meaningful ways. You know, as far as is, is me, if you, if you have any questions, and especially for this community, I would love to be engaged. I love... To, to help out anywhere I can. I'm not a big social media guy. I, I don't really put myself out there in that way. Um, but please feel free to send me an email, brendan at utopiancoffee.com. That's B-R-E-N-D-O-N at utopiancoffee.com. I would love to, to help in any way I can, even if you just have questions, if you want to have a conversation and bat some ideas around, I'm here and available. That's so awesome. Brendan, thank you so much. And as I often say to my guests, and I feel the same way about you, is thanks for making the world a better place. I appreciate you elevating humanity in such a way that my children get to grow up in a world that you're shaping. Thank you so much, man. I can't wait to have a coffee with you someday down the road, hopefully in some exotic location, sharing an experience, experiencing you know, true happiness with you. Thanks again for being part of our life, being part of the Front Row community. Can't wait to uh, connect with you again, brother. Take care. Thanks so much, John. See ya. Thanks for listening, everybody. I hope you enjoyed my chat with Brendan from utopiancoffee.com. Now, I would like to treat you to a cup of Utopian coffee. So we're going to do something I've never done before. If you write a review on iTunes about this show and you take a screenshot of that and you email it to john at frontrowglobal.com, that's J-O-N at frontrowglobal.com, I would like to send the first five reviews a free bag of Utopian coffee along with my favorite coffee mug. And as a little bonus, if you tell me your shirt size, I'm going to send you a front row t-shirt. I would like to do this to treat you to my favorite cup of coffee. And we can talk about that for years to come, your first day that you ever tried Utopian. I also want to say that, uh, oh, and by the way, go to frontrowfactor.com slash review 
as a shortcut to get you there. Or if you're listening on your phone, you can just click on my face. It'll pop up in the show notes and you can click the review button and that'll get you there as well. Make sure to check out the Encore episode with Brendan. That's a quick 10 to 15 minute Q&A from questions from you in the community directly to Brendan. Now, the way that you can ask questions for future interviews and future guests is by going to frontrowfriends.com, join our online community and post there any questions that you have and we'll ask them on your behalf. A great way for you to get involved and get some quality answers to your questions from our future guests. So until next time, keep living life in the front row. Can't wait to have you back on the next show. Take care, everybody. That's all for this episode of The Front Row Factor. To discover more simple and effective ways to lead a fearless front row life, please visit frontrowfactor.com and subscribe to John's Four Minutes in the Front Row, where he shares quick stories from real life experiences. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope our show inspires you to live big, give big, and experience life to the fullest. See you next time on The Front Row Factor.